Good morning and welcome to Monash City Church of Christ. It is great that you can join us here today. I'm greeting you from the comfort of my own home, just as you are watching this in the comfort of yours. Today we will be continuing our second part in our three-part series of the book of Habakkuk. The theme is around surviving the dip that we are currently in. We will be crossing over to Liquid Church Online shortly with our speaker Tim Lucas, who is the founder and lead pastor of Liquid Church. He's, as you know, full of creativity and humor and lots of energy when it comes to delivering his sermons, so please stay tuned. Before we continue though, we're going to go into a time of songs and praise, as well as communion with some light announcements to follow. Oh, 
And on that day when my strength is failing, the end draws near and my time has come. Still my soul will sing your praise unending. Ten thousand years and then forevermore. Forevermore. Worthy is the king who conquered the grave. 
God, I Know You're There, was published last year, and while it's specially for children, I think it has something for all of us. Wind, I can't see you. Still, I know you're there. I feel you dance across my face and rustle through my hair. Sun, I can't reach you, but still, I know you're there. I see you shining down on earth. You're beaming everywhere. Sky, I can't hold you. Still I know you're there. You stretch so wide, so far, so high, in bluenesses beyond compare. Clouds, I can't snuggle you. Still I know you're there. I watch your forming puffy shapes, a lion, a bird, a bear. Moon, I can't swing from you, still I know you're there. You're hanging like a silver nightlight in the evening air. Stars, I can't touch you, still I know you're there. You twinkle like a coat of jewels the universe can wear. Rainbow, I can't slide down you, still I know that you are there. Your colours arc the heavens art, both beautiful and rare. Rainfall, I can't count your drops, still I know you're there. You ripple through the city streets and puddle in the town square. Thunder, I can't watch you, still I know you're there. The lightning blinks before you boom, your nature's stormy path. Tiny seed, you're hidden deep, still I know you're there. And one day soon you'll stretch and bloom as flowers I can share. Snowflake, I can't trace your crystals, still I know you're there. You've been designed so I won't find one like you anywhere. God, I can't see you, still I know you're there. You're in the love I give away, the sparkle when I care. And if your love is what I show, my heart is fuller still, I know. I was going to suggest that the children do the following exercise with us, but it could be good for all of us. We've probably got a little bit of time on our hands at the moment. So, if you have a pen and paper, let's make a list of each of the things in our book so that later you can draw some of these concepts and see what God says to you through them. So, we need to write down wind, sun, Sky, clouds, moon, stars, rainbow, rainfall, thunder, 
seeds, snowflakes. Oh, so later when you draw these, you might check and see what God says to you through them. So as I was thinking about it, when it came to wind, I thought, Holy Spirit, I can't see him, but I see something of what he does. The sun made me think of light. Jesus, the light of the world. The sky, how wide is God's love and forgiveness. The clouds, God is with me even in cloudy times. The moon, God brings light into dark situations. So do you get the idea? You can use mine, but it's good to think of your own. That is, listen to what God says to you. Then you can think of a way to express and share your message. I have started on mine, but you can work on yours and you can do the whole list. Just now we're going to turn to the back of the book where it says, Where is God? Why can't I see him? Is he here with me? And God says to us, I am here. I always am. You just have to remember to reach out to me. I know sometimes it's easy to forget, so I've put reminders all around, just like you read in the book. But also, I ask you to be still each week and let my spirit remind you that I love you so much that I sent Jesus into the world so that you would understand my love for you, my forgiveness, and the gift of real life. So let us be still just now and take communion together, remembering what Jesus says to us. worship God through our giving uh, to help advance the work of the Lord both locally and abroad through our mission family. Uh, The details of how you can do that will now appear on the screen. Father God, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your forgiveness. And thank you that you are the one who cares about us all. Help us to share your love, just like our little book says. 
God, I can't see you, still I know you're there. We're in, you're in the love I give away, the sparkle when I care. And if your love is what I show, my heart is fuller, still I know. And so, Father God, as we share your love with others around us, we also bring our gifts and offerings to you to share with you so that they may be shared with others. For we want everyone to know that you are there, that you love them and that you care. And so to this end, we commit ourselves in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today we are in week two of our series, Surviving the Dip, which is on the Old Testament book of Habakkuk. Can you say Habakkuk? Better yet, can you spell it in the chat? H-A-B-A-K-U-K. He is an Old Testament, old school prophet. And Habakkuk looked at the world all around him and he said, man, my world is jacked up. It's full of suffering and violence and injustice. And he had a question for God. He said, why? God, why do you allow all this evil to go on? So last week, I asked you to type in the chat. I said, if you had to ask God a question, like, God, why? If you could ask him one question, what would it be? Holy moly, you guys lit up the chat. Responses poured in. Here's a sample of them. Um, God, why so much racial discrimination and injustice? God, why is my marriage ending? Why am I sick? God, why did you not protect me from evil men when I was young? God, why are you letting me go through multiple job dips? God, why did you let my dad die alone in a nursing home? Do you feel it? The heaviness, the heartfelt questions, we all have them. And Habakkuk taught us that a deeply committed Christian can have both questions and faith at the same time. Guys, God doesn't just like tolerate your hard questions. He welcomes them. Because it's a sign that you're ready to wrestle with God. Remember, that's what the name Habakkuk literally means. It means to wrestle or embrace. And when wrestling with God is not a sign of weak faith. It actually shows that you care deeply. What do you do when the brokenness of the world doesn't line up with the character of the loving God you know? You Habakkuk, you wrestle. Now, last week I showed you how the Christian journey, for most people, the journey of following Jesus often looks a little bit like a roller coaster, right? It starts down here, goes up, goes down into a dip, and eventually goes on. Think of it this way, if you're new, I'll just quick review here. Let's say you're a non-Christian, you don't have a relationship with God. What I find is most people say, well, Tim, God started lighting a spark in me. I, I talked with a friend who was a Christian and he prayed for me and that prayer got answered. And so I read a book and then, then they invited me to church and I went to church and the sermon wasn't terrible. I understood it and I, I felt something warm. It was like the love of God. And suddenly you become a Christian. You go into a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's amazing. That's life-changing for most people. You ever have that happen, guys, where, remember, can you remember back when you first received Christ and life, everything changed. It's like your eyes opened. You start reading the Bible and like verses pop off the page. You're like, my gosh, God wrote this just for me. And, and you pray and like God answers your prayers. You, you join a small group, you start serving, you're using your gifts and, and faith is wonderful. Sometimes we like to joke, that's because you're on the Jesus juice. I, I'm not trying to be irreverent, but these are the mountaintop moments, right? You have that moment when, man, my God is real. My faith is on fire. But watch, at some point in the journey, one day you go to church and, hmm, the message didn't appeal to me. Maybe it's Tim 
or the, the music was kind of dry and you left with a bad taste in your mouth. You actually felt spiritually cold or distance. And the reality sets in is that we all go through these dry spells. But here's the thing. Sometimes we'll slam right into a wall of faith. What happens when the girl who brought you to church breaks up with you? What? What happens when you pray for someone who's sick and they not only don't get better, they get worse? God, what's going on here? What happens when a relationship falls apart or you go bankrupt or your business fails? Life isn't turning out like you thought it would and you experience what Henry Blackaby calls a crisis of faith. What happens when what you currently see doesn't correspond to what you previously believed? You say, I don't know what I believe anymore. I'm having a crisis of faith. Guys, this happens to every one of us. A crisis can happen through a messy divorce. A crisis can happen through a, a cancer diagnosis or a shattered dream. Maybe it's an inability to get pregnant or adopt. Maybe you have a deep desire to be married one day and you thought, God said I would have a spouse, but it's not been fulfilled yet. We all hit a wall, a crisis of faith at some point, and it can leave us brittle. We don't know what God's doing. We wonder where he is and when will this be over? And guys, this, as we said, is a decision point, right? Moment of decision. I found that people either want to go back to the mountaintop or give up altogether. They want to go back and they say, you know what? I'm just going to smile through this and, and sing songs about victory when my whole life's really falling apart. They're kind of in denial. Or they want to give up all together. They say, you know what? I feel betrayed by God. God was answering my prayers. Now he's not. I thought I could trust the loving God. What kind of loving God would do this to me? People feel like God promised them something. And instead, God, you gave me pain. And so we wonder, is any of this stuff real to begin with? Trust gets choked and they watch. They give up. They walk away on faith. Maybe that describes somebody you know, or maybe that describes you. Maybe you lost someone or something you love. Maybe a relationship came apart or God's not answering your prayers. Well, you can go back or give up, or you can choose the more difficult road and say, all right, God, I am going to lean in. And here's what will happen. God will take you on a journey, and it may not happen all at once. In fact, things may actually get worse and be painful for some time. But at some point, you begin to lean in and draw on the strength of Christ, who says, in your weakness, I'm going to give you my strength. My grace is sufficient for you. And you find that God holds you in the palm of your hand, and he's carrying you. And you're learning new things about the character of God that don't have to do with your circumstances. And he takes you to a higher, deeper level of intimacy and trust and closeness with God that you couldn't get any other way. See, all of us go through ups and downs, but not all of us stick it out when we're in the dip. That's what I call this right here, the dip of doubt. Every Christian goes through it at some time. And a lot of people think like, well, that's for weak people, right? We shouldn't doubt. But do you know some of the greatest heroes of the faith had their own doubts? They had hard questions for God. And the secret of the dip is that if you will actually lean in, it can slingshot you. It gives you spiritual momentum to go to a different level of faith. You know, the interesting thing is right now, our nation is in a dip, isn't it? First, we were hit a global pandemic. That's a pretty big dip. But right now, in a lot of ways, we're in a double dip. All this racial injustice and pain and outrage. And people are rightly crying out. They're like, God, why? Why is this suffering and injustice going on? God, when are we going to get out of this? But listen to me. If you resist the temptation to go back or give up and you lean into that dip, it can slingshot you. Spiritual momentum. It can actually take you to a higher level of knowing this God, his character that's not based on circumstances, but a deep trust in his goodness in spite of your situation, your doubts. And here's an interesting idea. It's that faith is not this linear journey, is it? Look at this thing. It's not straight and steady up and to the right. It's like a roller coaster. But guys, that's how God matures you as a follower of Christ. Guys, God wants to wean you off of the sippy cup of Jesus juice. And he wants to teach you to wrestle with him, embrace him in hard times. Now, if you recall, Habakkuk actually has three chapters with three different themes. In the first chapter, we saw Habakkuk wrestle with God. That's what his name 
means. But today in chapter two, we're going to learn from Habakkuk, how do you actually wait on God? Like when you're in the dip, how do you wait? What do you do? You've all heard that phrase, waiting on God. Sometimes when you're in this dip of doubt, you're like, I'm waiting and waiting and waiting some more, looking at your watch, God, when are you going to come? But if you trust him, he eventually will take you out of chapter two to chapter three, where you will learn to worship him in a brand new way. You're going to like chapter three next week when we finish our series worshiping him at this level where I praise him for who he is and what he's done, even if my circumstances don't show it. But today, guys, we're in chapter two. I want to talk about what it means to wait on God. Everybody say, wait a minute. (laughs) Guys, waiting on God is hard. Let's just be honest about it. Our entire country right now, we're all waiting, aren't we? We are waiting to see family and friends again. We're waiting to reopen churches and stores We're waiting to go to a friend's backyard barbecue. Some of us are waiting to get out of sweatpants one morning and go to work. (laughs) Maybe you're waiting to get a haircut or waiting for a graduation party. We are waiting on a serious note for systemic change, for discrimination and brutality to end. We're waiting for racial justice and peace. Right now, across America, listen, everybody is enrolled in God's school of waiting. And all of us hate it. At least I do. Anybody else hate to wait? Type it in the chat if you hate to wait. I hate to wait. It's okay. Patience is not one of my natural spiritual gifts, but it's a fact of life for all of us. Did you know if you're average, the average American will spend two years of your life waiting in line. Literally two years of your life going like this. Waiting in line. That does not even include the DMV, by the way. (laughs) The average American, 43 days of your life on hold on the phone. 43 days waiting, listening to elevator music. If you have cable vision, it's 243 days. (laughs) Here's my question. If you're in the dip today, how do you wait on God? Well, the answer is found in Habakkuk chapter 2. So turn there in your Bible or follow on the screen. We're going to read the first four verses. And after Habakkuk asks these hard questions of God, here's what he says. He says, I will climb up to my watchtower and stand at my guard post. There I will, what's the word, church? Wait to see what the Lord says. And God, how are you going to answer my complaint? Then the Lord said to me, write my answer plainly on tablets so that a runner can carry the correct message to others. The vision, God says, is for a future time. It describes the end, and mark my words, it will be fulfilled. If it seems slow in coming, what's it say, church? Wait patiently, for it will surely take place. It will not be delayed. But the righteous will live by their faithfulness to God. So in chapter one, Habakkuk has all these hard questions for God. He's wrestling, God, have you abandoned Israel? Their nation was falling apart. Israel, like America, was in a double dip. Their culture was corrupt. It was immoral. It was unjust. But then on top of that, they were about to be invaded by the Babylonians. So Habakkuk's like, God, you got any plans to save us here? And in chapter two, God says, I got an answer for you. But the vision is for a future time. In other words, if it seems slow in coming, here it is again, wait patiently. In other words, Habakkuk, I'm going to lead you out of this dip, but I first want to teach you to wait. I want you to think of the dip as God's waiting room. (laughs) It's where he takes every follower of Christ at some point in their journey to grow and mature and become more like Jesus. And that's hard. Let's just be honest, man. We all hate to wait, right? We live in a world of of DoorDash and overnight delivery. Nobody wants to wait. In fact, I only know one person who doesn't mind waiting at all. Doesn't faze them in the least. And that is God. (laughs) According to the Bible, God is incredibly comfortable with waiting. In fact, he's not only comfortable, I think he actually likes it. Because God says, oh, I do some of my best work, watch, when my children learn to wait on me. The problem is this. When you and I hit this painful dip, we just want to get out. How long do I have to wait? I want to get out of here, God. And God says, guess what? I ain't in a rush. I got all the time in the world to work this out with you. In fact, I want to teach you something. And he enrolls us, whether we like it or not, in the school of waiting. Well, guys, class is in session. (laughs) The truth is God teaches every Christian to wait on him at some point. And if you unpack these verses, God actually teaches us three things in the school of waiting. Here's the curriculum. He's going to teach you patience, perspective, and perseverance. If you're taking notes, that's our new PPP, all right? Patience, perspective, and perseverance. Let's look at quickly at each one. First, patience. 
In verse 3, did you see what God says to Habakkuk? He says, if it seems slow in coming, wait patiently, for it will surely take place. It will not be delayed. Now, we all know what patience is. It's defined as the capacity to accept or tolerate delay, trouble or suffering without getting angry or, or upset, right? We say, I don't know if I have the patience for another 90 minute Zoom call. But let me give you a different spiritual definition. From God's perspective, patience is us laying down the burden of assumed omniscience. That's a fancy word. Omniscience simply means that God knows everything. He, he can see the whole plan, he has all the answers. But the reality is you and I, have assumed omniscience. In other words, most of us assume we know what God should do in any given situation, right? And when we're in a dip, it's very easy to say, God, you're getting this wrong. God, you're not fixing this the way you should. We think that we know how this problem should be solved and how long it should take. God is not answering according to my timetable. God, you missed the deadline because I got assumed omniscience. I know how life should go. Get it back on track. The reality is we don't know, do we? The Bible actually says God's ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than your thoughts. In other words, God don't think like you and me, right? Like we measure time in days, weeks, months, but God sees our whole journey in light of something called eternity. Forever after and forever after that. Eternity. God knows exactly what he's doing because he sees how it all ends with the return of Jesus. And he said, you know what? I'll even use this, this bad stuff in here for your good and my glory in the end. But when we're in pain, patience is just hard. We want to hightail it out of there. But God says, no, 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 don't rush. The school of waiting is how I form Christ in the hearts of my dearest children. Do you know every single person in the Bible that God ever used powerfully is a graduate of the school of waiting? Heroes of the faith like Moses, you know what God told Moses? He said, Moses, I'm going to use you to deliver my people from slavery. I'm going to liberate the nation of Israel through you. So he sends Moses on a road trip that lasted 40 years. <laughs> what? You kidding me? 40 years. You talk about a dip. After Egypt, Moses probably thought, man, I'll just probably take a couple weeks to get to the promised land, right? Maybe, maybe a month or two. Woo, we're out of Egypt. 40 years, 40, four decades in a dip. But God made Moses a promise, but he said, first, I'm going to teach you patience. Or how about um, Joseph? You remember the guy with the rainbow coat? God told Joseph, hey, Joseph, you're going to be a great leader one day over your, all your brothers, the entire nation. What happens? First, his brothers throw Joseph in a pit. Then he's unjustly accused, and he actually has to go to prison. They, they, can you, a double dip, okay? From a pit to a prison for how long? 10 years. Guys, a decade in the dip. God made a promise, but 10 years until he fulfilled it. But when the time was right, God elevated Joseph from the pit and the prison to a palace, second in command over Egypt, where Joseph emerged with this richer faith, a deeper trust and closeness with God. Guys, scripture is filled with story after story of people who are handpicked by God, and he promises them a key role in his larger story of salvation. But first, they got to learn to wait on God. 10 years, 40 years. At the time, Moses and Joseph didn't know what God was doing. But at some point, both said, all right, God, you're writing the story, not me. So watch, I give up the burden of assumed omniscience. I don't know what you're doing, but that's okay. Guys, that is so hard especially when our prayers are painful. Here are a few more prayers that you sent in last week on the Facebook live stream. Uh, Jermaine asked, God, why are black and brown brothers and sisters still being persecuted? Uh, Sonia said, God, why is COVID-19 lasting so long? God, why did you take so many of my friends and coworkers? Why can't I fight this depression and anxiety? Guys, understand something. It is okay to pray and ask God to intervene in a painful situation because oftentimes he will. So you pray, you say, Lord, please stop the migraines. God, heal my loved one. God, bring peace and justice for people of color. But listen to me. If it doesn't happen right away, don't lose hope. Because Habakkuk is teaching us that God's delays are not always God's denials. Just because God doesn't do something right away doesn't mean he won't do it in the long run. God says to Habakkuk, actually, you can read the rest of it in your small group, chapter two. He says, I'm going I'm to judge the wicked Babylonians. That's a promise. 
But he says, if it seems slow in coming, wait patiently, for it'll surely take place. It will not be delayed. In other words, it's going to happen, just not in your timetable. See, guys, God's delays are not always God's denials, which means in the dip, you've got to surrender your need for control and say, God, the outcome is up to you. When you take your hands off the wheel and you learn to wait on the Lord, whoo, that is easier said than done, isn't it? You know, I told you last week how our family, um, we hit a dip when my dad was diagnosed with lymphoma. Um, everything had been up and to the right, but we had this painful crisis of belief. And when we started praying, all our prayers were about instant healing. Like, like we had faith that Jesus can do that. We've seen him do that. And you know what? God invites us to ask him for a miracle. But when we found out that his cancer wasn't curable, whoa, it's something you actually work long and hard for remission. It changed how we prayed. We didn't just pray for remission. We started praying for patience. God made us wait with every scan, with every test. We'd see God come through day by day, a positive test here, a good week there. And suddenly we actually had a, a longer stretch. It was three months. Then it was nine months, 15 months, 24 months of remission, a new experimental drug. And God was just teaching our family something. He's like, I want you to hold my hand every day in the dip. Doesn't matter how long you're in it. That was hard. But guys, we had no other choice. In the school of waiting, we learned to take refuge in the unshakable character of Christ, not just our day-to-day -day circumstances. By the way, God did something pretty amazing on my dad's cancer journey. I mean, we prayed, we actually prayed the prayer of Hezekiah, a dying king who asked God to add 15 years to his life. And my dad got 15 years and one month before he went home to be with Jesus in eternity. Now that was a different outcome than we had in mind, I'll be honest. It was a different timetable, but looking back, it was God's gift to our family. He just tenderly taught us patience and how to care for people with chronic pain. See guys, the school of waiting, that's where we surrender control. We admit to ourselves and God, I, I assumed I knew it was best, but I'm laying that burden down so I can embrace patience. Jesus, I trust your timing. You know what God says? He says, good choice. Because I got a plan for your life. I made you a promise. If it seems slow in coming, wait patiently, for it will surely take place. It will not be delayed. Write this down, church. Put it in the notes. God's delays are not always God's denials. Lesson number one from the school of waiting. God gives us patience. The second gift God gives us in the dip is a new perspective. Specifically, how to look at life from his vantage point, not our own. Look what Habakkuk says in verse 1. He says this, I will climb up to my watchtower and stand at my guard post. Then I'll wait, here we are waiting again, to see what the Lord says and how he'll answer my complaint. Now, this is interesting because in ancient times, cities had watchtowers. It looked something like this. And soldiers would actually scramble up the tower. Why? To get a vantage point of the battlefield. They, they have a new perspective. From the tower, right, you could see friends or enemies coming. You could look in the distance, you see invaders, but reinforcements are coming from, from over here. And so a tower is a way of getting a, a, a God's eye perspective. Guys, when you're in a dip, you have to get God's perspective on your pain. I think of the Apostle Paul. He's another graduate of the School of Waiting. And God promised Paul, he said, I'm going to use your life to spread the story of Jesus around the whole world. And yet Paul suffered many painful dips in his journey. In fact, listen to 2 Corinthians. He actually made a list of them. Paul writes this in his journal. He says, okay, let me go through it. I have been put in prison more often. I've been whipped more times without number. I have faced death again and again. Five different times, the Jewish leaders gave me 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. By the way, that's stoned with rocks, not like... Okay, follow me, follow. Three times I was shipwrecked. Once I spent a whole night and a day adrift at sea. I've actually traveled on many long journeys. I've faced rivers, dangers from robbers. I've been hungry and thirsty. I've gone without food. Guys, what? Uh, this is more than a dip. This is like a double dip, triple dip Sunday, man. Paul's like, I've been stoned, whipped, shipwrecked, starving. If anyone had a reason to go back or give up, it was the apostle Paul. And yet somehow the same man, from the perspective of eternity, he writes these words. For our light and momentary troubles, what? Are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Like, what? 
how can Paul say light and momentary? Brother almost died. <laughs> Paul didn't have a bad day. He had a bad decade. <laughs> His health was failing. He was in and out of prison. People are trying to kill him. But he said, yeah, I've got troubles. But watch, to put it in the perspective of whoosh, eternity, I'm going to go up to the tower. These problems are light and momentary. They won't last very long compared to the glory God has waiting for me. Paul goes up to the tower and he's looking down at the dip from the perspective of eternity. He's looking at the long game. The long game. He says, these aren't going to last very long. In fact, they're producing this eternal glory in me. In other words, there's purpose to my pain. Do you know that? Your pain has a purpose. Remember, God's goal for your life, guys, is not happiness. It's holiness. That's conforming you to the character of Christ. God wants to make you just like Jesus. And so in the dip, one of the things he does with it is he strips us of everything that isn't holy. Not just sin, but like the roots, our pride, our ego, our need for control. Oh, I hate it. And sometimes God will use a crisis to shift something inside us. Guys, he'll even strip us of blessings. Comforts that we became too attached to so we can learn to treasure Christ alone. It's painful, but this is how God matures our faith. If you will get up in the watchtower like Habakkuk, you will get God's perspective on your pain. And when your perspective changes, so will your prayers. You won't just pray, God, change my situation. You'll say, God, change me. Whatever you got to do, do, build my faith, God. Deepen my trust. Change my heart. I know you love me and you're working all things together for my good. Even when I can't see it, I know you're working, God. And guys, that perspective gives us such hope in hard times. Amen? Like, take the situation we're in right now with the, the racial turmoil in our nation. I mean, let's be honest. Guys, this is a deeply painful dip for America. It's painful for people of color, for police, for all of us. It's like these raw racial wounds have been ripped wide open. And I know most people, let's just be honest, they just want to move right past it. Can we just get, no, 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 don't stop. God is birthing a new perspective, isn't he? Isn't he? Can you see it in the air? White folks like me <laughs> are waking up to systemic injustice and the need to actually stand up and speak up because that perspective is, the, the eternal perspective, this isn't a black-white issue. This is a human issue. This is a justice issue. This is a Jesus issue. And racial justice is kingdom work. I know it's hard to watch night after night. I know some of you are tired of watching and it can seem like, man, nothing is going to change here. But don't you forget, you serve a God of justice who's coming again. You serve a God who's so concerned about sin and suffering, he sent his only son to enter it on a cross. So you got to get God's perspective. I like what uh, Dr. Martin Luther King said in one of his sermons. He said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Translation, I want you to take the long view. The arc of the moral universe is long. In other words, change ain't going to happen overnight. There's going to be moments when the situation seems hopeless, but as God changes one heart at a time, one church at a time, one neighborhood at a time, one city at a time, justice will come. Amen? The arc of God's universe, it bends towards justice. It, look at what Habakkuk says. He says, the vision is for a future time. It describes the end. And listen, it will be fulfilled. If it seems slow in coming, just wait patiently. It will surely take place. It will not be delayed. Guys, I came here to tell somebody that God's dream of justice, it may be delayed right now, but justice will not be denied. Amen? When Jesus Christ returns, he will expose all evil, wipe out sin, and set the world straight. Jesus will judge. But until then, watch this, we, his protégés, we're apprentices in training, we're going to work and struggle to pull heaven down to earth and bring peace on earth as it is in heaven. I tell you that so that you don't stop. Do not stop praying. Don't stop protesting. Don't stop peacemaking. Don't stop asking God, give me a new perspective. Change my heart, because that's how God changes the world. That's the perspective you got to have when you're in the dip. In the school of waiting, God gives us so much. He teaches us patience. We gain his perspective. And finally, God gives us perseverance. An ability to actually push through the pain, hold tight, Habakkuk to Jesus, and trust him to get us to the other side. You want to see something cool? 
Here's how James outlines the Christian journey in his letter. He says it this way. Watch this. Consider it pure joy, my brothers. Woo, joy. When you go through trials, what? Not one problem, double dip, triple dip. When you go through trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith, oh, it's hard, I'm going through a test, the trial develops, what's the word, church? Perseverance. And perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Just like Jesus. That's the goal. Get off the sippy cup. This is the goal. Mature, grown up in Christ. Do you know that's God's goal for your life? He wants to mature you. He wants to grow some of you up. He says, I love you too much to let you stay a sippy cup Christian, drinking Jesus juice your whole life, thinking, well, as long as God gives me what I like, I can trust him. That's baby faith. God loves you too much to let you stay a sippy cup Christian where you only follow God when he does what you want and follows your timetable. Newsflash. God don't work for you. <laughs> he ain't your assistant. If you think he is, that's a false God. See, on the other side of this dip, we meet the real God of the Bible who permits pain and suffering. Not because he is a sadist, but because he's so powerful, he can even bend the bad stuff for our good and his glory in eternity. Amen? That's our God. That's the real God. In the dip, he is forging a new strength in you. What James calls perseverance an ability to embrace Jesus in these, these hard times and push through the pain and live by faith. Look at verse four, Habakkuk says this, but the righteous will live by their faith or their faithfulness to God. Now, what is faith? I'll close with this. Faith is the ability to see the invisible God going before you. To realize I'm on this journey, but I ain't alone. I've got a guide and his name is Jesus. See, it's the journey of Jesus that can give you the eyes of faith to see your story in light of his. What does the journey of Jesus actually teach us? Well, there's so many things we can learn from Jesus, but here's the most important. The gospel teaches us that a cross always comes before a crown. Here's the crown in heaven waiting for you. Woo, I want the crown. Well, there's ain't no way to get it without going through the cross. That's what the story of Jesus, his journey, we're following him in his footsteps. We're followers of Christ. That's your story. Habakkuk, guys, is a microcosm of the gospel. I mean, if you think about the life of Jesus, it's the same thing. Jesus walked perfectly with God and he began healing the sick and feeding the poor. And everybody was following him until he got to Jerusalem. And uh-oh, uh-oh. I'm going to actually die on a cross. And Judas didn't like that very much. And he betrayed him. And then his friends abandoned him. And actually, Jesus had a crisis of his own. And he had a hard question for God. He said, why, my God, have you forsaken me? I don't want to go. Can you remove this cup from me? Jesus didn't want to go down into the dip, but he did it for you and for me out of love. Guys, the story of Habakkuk is a microcosm of Jesus' story. In fact, Habakkuk's just the ultimate uh, Jesus example. If you think of it this way, chapter one right here is his story up and to the right. But chapter two, Jesus enters this dip of doubt. But chapter three here is not cross and crucifixion. It is what? Resurrection. Resurrection to new life. We all love chapter three, don't we? But guess what? Before it came three days in the dip, three days in a grave where all hope seemed lost. No peace, no justice, there's no rescue. I mean, to the disciples, this moment must have seemed like the story is over. Let's go back to fishing, boys. They had the same questions you and I have. God, why'd you let this happen? God, this isn't fair. God, this ain't the way life should supposed to go. Watch. But from an eternal perspective, up in the tower, God was working, wasn't he? Jesus did endure pain and death for no good reason. He was conquering pain and death entirely to bring you eternal life and salvation. Amen? Make some noise. Light up the chat for that. Because we got great hope for the future. If you will see your story with the eyes of faith, you will see that Jesus' journey, it mirrors yours. God will give you his patience. He will give you a new perspective 
and he'll give you the perseverance to make it through. Maybe you're here today and you'll say, Tim, I'm right here right now. I'm stuck in chapter two. I, I see chapter three is ahead, but I don't know if I'm gonna get there, but I'm gonna trust God. I'm gonna wait patiently because I have, what's the word in verse four? The righteous will live by their faithfulness to God. You have to see your life through the gospel lens. On your journey, guys, same as Jesus. A cross always comes before a crown, always. I'm going to close with this promise from Hebrews 12. I want to read it together. Wherever you are, just read it out loud with me. Let us run with, what's the word? Perseverance, the race marked out for us. Fixing our eyes on who? On Jesus, the pioneer. He went before you, the perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, what's it say, church? He endured the cross, scorning its shame, and he sat down at the right hand on the throne of God. Guys, that's where you get the strength to persevere. You fix your eyes on Jesus. You follow the leader. When you're in the dip, you Habakkuk. You hold tight. You embrace Jesus because he promised, never will I leave you or forsake you. I will carry you through your pain because guess what? I've been there and it's glory on the other side. God will give you the strength to persevere one step at a time following the footsteps of Jesus. That's where you get the strength to wait on God. Guys, that's where you find hope in hard times. Fix your eyes on Christ right now. Follow him. Even if you can't see it or feel it, God is working and Jesus is on his throne. Amen? He's making all things new, including you. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, I pray right now. Lord God, I feel it. It's filling people up, Father God. You have chosen this generation for such a time as this. So Father, let us live into your freedom. God, we know how this story ends, but God, we're crying out, Lord. Bring healing to our land. Bring justice, God, to our world. Father, there will be no peace until the Prince of Peace enters the fray, but you're coming through your people. So Father God, I pray for those of us who are depressed, who are tired, lift them up on eagle's wings, Father God. Fill them with the Holy Spirit. Lord, for those who are confused and hurting, you are a tender God. You're a shepherd, Jesus. You hold us close to your heart. If you don't know Jesus yet, I would just invite you, give your life to him. Just say, Jesus, come into my heart. Just say it where you are. Jesus, come into my heart. I need a leader. I need a savior. Forgive me of my sin. I want to follow you. As painful as life will be, I need a rescuer. Lead me, Father. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. I belong to you. Father, I thank you that the ultimate victory has already come and it's coming. And so, Father, right now, I send your people out in the name of Jesus to be peacemakers, faithful, wrestlers, Habakkuk, God. May we embrace you as we reflect you to the world around us. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. I hope you have felt very encouraged by our second part of our three-part series on the book of Habakkuk. Until next week, I'll have a reading from 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 16, as we peacefully wait on him. Now may the Lord of peace give you his peace from all times and in every situation. The Lord be with you all. Have a great week and thanks for tuning in.